I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever given Brussels the respect it deserves. Whenever it popped up on the radar as a possible episode location, I'd vacillate for a while before saying, eh, we'll get it next time. I've done that for six years now. But circumstance forced my hand, and reluctantly I found myself arriving in what I had always assumed was a gray, soulless, concrete canyon of bureaucracy. And I couldn't be happier to be so, so wrong. Brussels is primarily served by the imaginatively named Brussels Airport, a decent, no-nonsense airport just outside the city itself. Nothing faffy, nothing ostentatious going on here, just clean Belgian efficiency at its best. Trains will get you quickly and easily from the airport into Brussels proper. Belgian Rail operates trains to all three main Brussels stations from the airport. They take around 15 or 20 minutes and you'll pay just over 9 euros for the privilege. You can buy your ticket from the vending machines in the airport train stations located just below the airport itself. Taxis and Uber are both available, but are much more expensive than the fast train services. Because we're in Europe, there is a very good chance you could be arriving in Brussels on a train. International services from other European cities like London, Amsterdam, Paris, and Frankfurt arrive here, Brussels Midi Station, while Brussels Nord and Brussels Central generally but not exclusively serve local and regional routes. Brussels has a tidy and efficient metro system, particularly useful when you're standing in the rain like I am. It will get you pretty much wherever you need to go in the city. Now there's four metro lines and three fast tram lines, many of which share station infrastructure that spider to every corner of the city. A single ticket costs just two euros if you buy from a machine, but if you feel like you're gonna ride the metro more than just a couple of times a day, it's well worth getting one of these, a day pass. Costs just eight euros from a ticket machine, and it means you can ride on any form of transport interchangeably throughout the day. You validate or tap your ticket in the small machines located in buses and trams or at the entrance to metro stations and major tram stops. You can switch between metro, tram, and bus services for that entire hour as well as interrupting your journey if necessary, but do make sure you validate your ticket or tap in. It is a rare treat when an episode is sponsored by a product that I actually already use and would talk about anyway. Seriously, that never happens. Mobile games don't count. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, I am extremely picky when it comes to my luggage. I travel a lot and I cannot have my carry-on throw up all over itself in the security line at some backwater airport in the Yucatan. But I also do not want my luggage to look like I'm transporting live human organs. Seriously, enough with the bulletproof luggage, people. My weapon of choice is the Carl Friedrich Carry-On Pro. It has this tough polycarbonate exterior shell, which means I can throw it around like I usually do with my luggage, but it's also got these lovely leather accents, which kind of class it up a little bit. And if you give them a little bit more money, they will personalize for you. I've done mine. And I would love to hear in the comments what you think the I stands for. It's also got this external hard shell for quick access to things I'll need at the airport, laptop, passports, that kind of thing. And hear that? No, you don't, because those are silent Japanese Hinamoto 360 degree spinner wheels. Silent. And if you click on the link below, you will get 15% not just off this, but off of every Carl Friedrich product on carlfriedrich.com. Seriously, people, this is my carry-on. This is what I take on every trip. I love it. Go buy one. There's something odd about Belgian food. No one talks about it. It's just sort of there. It doesn't bother anybody. No one seems to notice. Like that one Kardashian that just kind of stands there. Bourdain never came here. My favorite travel writers and presenters never seem to come here. 
Most of my food books seem to skim right over it. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why. What you think about Belgian food, what comes to mind when you think about this country, is generally correct. The stereotypes are true. And that's fine because A, they're f***ing delicious, and B, when you dig a little deeper, every single one of them is fascinating. Remember, Belgium is only 54 years younger than the US. It didn't become its own country until 1860. Before then, it was essentially half French, half Dutch. So a lot of the culinary influences were from France and Holland. But let's not forget that at the time, those two countries were among the largest colonial powers in the world. So there's a lot going on here. It's not just waffles and fries. Okay, it is mainly just waffles and fries, but even they are surprisingly complex. Belgian waffle. That's what you think about when you think about this country, right? Here's the thing. Not uniquely Belgian. It was introduced in at least in the form that we all know and love in the US by a Belgian granted at the World's Fair in 1958. And Belgium's entry into the centuries-old waffles universe at the time was an oversimplified amalgamation of all of the regional waffle variations. And that version that burst onto the world stage in 1958 has somehow reverse osmosed back into Belgian cultural identity as this unique gastronomic icon. Now there's actually two versions that you're gonna find as you wander the streets of Brussels. The Brussels waffle, which is the waffle we all know and love, I would say, the crispy on the outside, powdered sugar, delicious in and of itself. And then the Liège version, which is chewier, uh, is pearl sugar in the middle, absolutely delicious in and of itself. And I strongly recommend that you try both versions while you're here. But frankly, to me, the provenance of the waffle, where it was invented, how it was invented, by whom it was invented, the correct versions, kind of irrelevant. They exist, and that's really all we need. That's small. Small. Despite the name, French fries are proudly claimed as a Belgian invention. Controversial, I know. The Belgians claim that the name refers to the cut and not the country of origin, and that French fries were invented in the 1600s in what is now Belgium, but was France. So you can see where the contention comes from. Murky backstory aside, what is uniquely Belgian is what they put on their fries. Sauces are a huge thing here and have elevated the fry from ubiquitous carb to unique cultural identifier and borderline personality trait. So ditch the ketchup, which here is considered for children, and take a stab at one of the hundreds of sauces that you can get on these beautiful, beautiful things. I've gone for mustard, which is European mustard, a little, little spicy, little piquant. It's right in the middle of the nose. Maison Antoine, which is where we got ours from, is apparently Angela Merkel's favorite place, and she would come from meetings at the European Parliament just down the road and stand in the queue with everybody else, and uh, you can see why. Belgian chocolate, peas in a pot. Belgian chocolate is phenomenal, and it's phenomenal for a reason. Not only are they the third largest producer of chocolate on the planet, it's also the most strictly regulated, with a ban on anything artificial, as well as palm and vegetable oils. This is pure, uncut, chocolatey goodness. Candy bars, chocolate bars, pralines, all inventions of the Belgian chocolate industry. This is a country that has perfected chocolate, and I am so glad that they have. God, I love chocolate. All that being said, it is only fair to point out that Belgian chocolate, while of undeniable quality, is a legacy of this country's brutal colonial aspirations. The Congo, or what was then known as the Belgian Congo, was plundered and pillaged for, among many other things, the raw materials for producing some of the finest chocolate the world has ever known. It is quite literally and figuratively bittersweet. The classics are everywhere in Brussels. Mool free, you can find just about everywhere. I encourage you to explore it and enjoy it in all its forms. With white wine, with garlic, you can't go wrong, except 
don't eat the ones that are closed. That's the rule for, for all shellfish. But Belgium has a significant coastline, so seafood, especially places like Nordsee here, is outstanding. Oysters, of course, uh, shrimp croquettes, and then one of my absolute favorites, sea snails. In this case, in a broth with, a, with garlic and endive and celery and things like that. On a day like today, cold February day, and a warm broth is one of the most satisfying things you can enjoy here. So good. But of course, the Belgians have a rich history in drink too, particularly in the beer sphere. Naturally, this requires further and thorough investigation. And what better place for our research than Delirium Cafe, which at one point had over 2,000 beers available, and appropriately named Guinness World Record. You can get beer everywhere, but what you cannot get everywhere, or at least the production of, is Trappist beer. There are only six Trappist breweries in Belgium. Actually, now five, as in 2021, one of them lost their definition. And that definition, much like champagne, is a protected definition, and a difficult one at that. To be called Trappist, the beer has to be produced within the walls of a monastery by the monks themselves, and the profit from the beer has to go back into the upkeep of the monastery. So not an easy definition to adhere to, but delicious nonetheless. Well done, monks. Who knew that monks could produce beer? Good beer. Drunks. Brussels is the de facto capital of the European Union, so it would be weird if it didn't use the euro. So it does. <laughs> Credit and debit cards are widely accepted, but I have seen a disproportionate amount of places with cash-only signs in the window. And I'm not just talking about little street vendors, I'm talking about restaurants, bars, coffee shops, all manner of places, so make sure you have some cash on you. On the flip side, there are also a lot of places that say card only. They tend to be more established chain-like places. So best advice I can give is to have a little bit of both on you. Tipping. Feels like we haven't talked about this in a very long time. But since we are in Europe, tipping is appreciated but certainly not expected. You are increasingly, though, going to see service charges added to your bill, especially in more touristy areas. So if you see that, you really only need to tip if your experience has been exemplary. Wait staff and bar staff are paid well here, so they don't need tips to survive, but it'll go a long way to show that you've had a great experience. Tax, both income and sales, are pretty high in Belgium, and that sales tax is going to get slapped on top of the cost of pretty much anything you buy. So things will feel a little bit more expensive than perhaps you're used to. You're all on the edge of your seat. Is he gonna do it? Let's do the rundown. A cup of coffee will cost you around two euros 50. A glass of beautiful Trappist beer will cost you just four euros. And for the most reliable indicator of a nation's cost, the good old Big Mac, you're gonna pay four euros and 85 cents. So about six US dollars. There. It's back. Happy? If nothing else, Brussels has given me stern lessons in preconception, reputation, and, dare I say it, humility. Are the stereotypes completely off-base and unfair? No. No, they're not. What we think we know of Brussels is, in many ways, entirely accurate, and that's okay. Brussels has absolutely nothing to be ashamed about. Great beer, great fries, great chocolate. Those alone put it way, way ahead of most cities I've been to. Add in the spectacular architecture, solid public transport, and friendly people. Well, put it this way. I'm not gonna let another six years go by before I come back. <laughs>